Thank you. Thanks so much for having me here today. I'm just thrilled to be able to talk with you about the value of a Penn State education. Um, the, I also want to be sure to thank Meg and Sophie and um, Sarah and all the folks who put this event together today because it really is truly wonderful and it's an honor to be here. In my role in undergraduate education, I spend quite a lot of time thinking about the value of a Penn State education, and I have to admit that I sometimes get frustrated by the prevailing neoliberal rhetoric that talks about the importance of education for jobs and the economy. Don't get me wrong, I think jobs and the economy are very important and a necessary part of our lives, but I worry that those conversations narrow our conceptualizations of, educations in way, of education in ways that really misses the point. Um, and so what I hope to do today is, if you will indulge me, um, you know that I write biographies and I know the power of stories. And so I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about um, my first year as an undergraduate student at Penn State and how that impacted um, still impacts my life today. And then I will shift gears just a little bit toward the end of my talk and um, show you places around campus um, that point to the value of the education and really the richness and fullness that a Penn State education can afford you. So the first time I stepped foot on campus um, was in the spring of 1984. I was a senior in high school and I was auditioning um, to be a student in Dr. Stephen Smith's piano studio. I was scared to death, much like I am right now. And, <laughs> um, and um, the, when Dr. Smith called me a few weeks later to say that I was admitted to be a piano performance student at Penn State, it changed my life in ways that I never could have imagined then. And I'll always be forever grateful to him for that opportunity. And so in August of 1984, my grandfather loaded all of my possessions into his F-150 Ford pickup truck and drove me from his farm in Perry County, Pennsylvania to um, University Park to move into East Halls. Um, my parents didn't want me to go to college and so somehow my father, grandfather must have drawn the short straw and he was the one who had to drag me off to school. And I think he was a little nervous because I remember at the time, we didn't talk much on that ride here, um, but he was driving his truck with no seat belt and he had a pack of cigarettes in his left pocket and he kept dropping them on the floor of his truck, and he never took his eyes off the road. He dropped the cigarette and put it in his mouth because he smoked unfiltered camel cigarettes, so it didn't matter which end of the cigarette went in his mouth. Um, but he drove, he, he got me to Hastings Hall, safe and sound. I was probably smelling a little smoky by the time I got here. Um, and we moved all of my things into my dorm room, and he disappeared for a few minutes and came back with a huge padlock. I don't know why he had a padlock in his truck, but he insisted that I had to lock the desk drawer and keep my money safe in there so that nobody would steal it, which in hindsight was kind of funny to me because I'm not sure I even had $50 to my name. <laughs> but he left and I started my studies and here we are today. Um, so the world in 1984 was a little different than it is now. Ronald Reagan was president of the United States. Michael Jackson topped the pop charts. Um, Princess Diana had captured the imagination of people around the world. Um, the Olympics were being held in Los Angeles that year. The space shuttle Discovery had its maiden voyage. And I called my grandparents once a week from a rotary dial phone that was attached to the wall of my dorm. It's true. I lived on 328 Hastings Halls. It looked much the same then as it does now. Those of you <laughs> who lived in Hastings Hall or East Halls know that. Um, Hastings Hall was an all women's dorm at the time. Um, and in the picture here, I was, on the, I was on the right side of the room. And my roommate, Carrie, was on the left side of the room. Um, but we had many of the same experiences you all have. We ate chicken cosmos in the dorms. We, um, uh, listened to the blue band practicing on Saturday morning home football games, and it was really just a terrific time for me in so many ways. Very exciting. Um, campus looked much the same then as now, too. These are pictures from the Levy yearbook um, from 1984 and 1985. The Lion Ambassadors were still giving um, pretty ambitious tours. Um, students fed squirrels. The, these are pictures are a little grainy, I apologize, but they're from the yearbook. Um, so we didn't have a squirrel whisperer necessarily, but they fed squirrels. <laughs> and the Nittany Lion was still a huge part of our home football game experience. 
I registered for my classes um, in the IM building. You had to stand in line and fill out a card. And so in addition to taking the uh, music and piano lesson classes that were part of my major, I had to take general education, as many of you know. And so the very first general education course that I took was a British literature class. And it was taught by Professor John, John Harwood. I still remember every book we read in that class. We read The Fox, we read Dr. Faustus, we read The Importance of Being Earnest, we read Charles Dickens, we, um, David Copperfield book, we read 1984, we read um, Clockwork Orange, and we read this book, Jude the Obscure. And that book challenged me in so many ways. Um, Penn State has this really lovely uh, tradition when you're a professor and you get promoted, you can put a book in the library. And so when I got promoted to full professor, I put Jude the Obscure in the library and I sent a note to Dr. Harwood to let him know why I had done that. The interesting thing is that Dr. Harwood's office is just down the hall from mine now on the fourth floor of Old Main. And so when we bump into each other in the hallway or going to our cars um, after a day's work, um, we often chat about the books we're reading. And from time to time we've had lunch. Who would ever have imagined that? As you know, I took lessons, piano lessons, with Dr. Stephen Smith. Um, so much of what he taught me in that first year of my um, experience at Penn State remains with me today. I can still picture him standing over the piano with his pencil going tempo, 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 because I tended to rush when I got nervous. Um, but he taught me how exquisitely beautiful a single note could be. And he taught me how important silence is in music. And one of his specialties is um, Beethoven's music, and Beethoven remains one of my all-time favorite composers. As a piano performance major, I had to pick up a second instrument, and so I decided that I would study violin. And I took violin lessons with um, Raymond Page, who is here. He was the viola player for the Allard String Quartet. And the Allard Quartet, the members of the Allard Quartet met when they were students at Juilliard, but they were in residence for a period of time here at Penn State, and they really were quite a remarkable group. They traveled the world, they were in New Zealand multiple times. Um, and one of the really interesting things is that after I got promoted to full professor, I decided that I would take violin lessons again. And now I take violin lessons with Joanne Feldman. Um, she's truly an amazing teacher. She's first chair of the Nittany Valley Sym Symphony Orchestra. She's the concert mistress, and I sit in the second violin section, way in the back, near the timpani, which is just fine with me. Um, but it's really, it's pretty amazing to do that. And it gets better yet. Last year, we did an all Beethoven concert, and um, Dr. Smith joined us to play um, one of the Beethoven concertos um, in, that, in that particular concert. I was just beside myself, it was amazing. Um, I was a student, um, as a first year student, I joined the Women's Chorus, and so this is a picture of me in Chambers Building on steps that I would walk many, many times as a faculty member and associate dean. Um, this picture is kind of funny to me for a number of reasons. It's, there's the Sheena Easton style haircut that I, I don't know what I was thinking about with that, but I was totally clueless. Um, as an undergraduate student, I thought I could sing. And <laughs> I was sure that I could. I was in the women's chorus. I had to audition. But years later, when I had children, they told me that I was a terrible singer. And I was devastated. And they reminded me that the only reason I was probably in the chorus was because I could play the piano. And I played the piano for the chorus. <laughs> so anyway, kids, kids can be very brutal. And so when I was at Penn State, I drank my very first coffee. I listened to the talking heads on my Sony Walkman as I walked across campus. I went to parties and danced to Madonna. Don't think about that one too much. <laughs> and I went to Eisenhower Auditorium and I heard my very first concert pianist, real live concert pianist. I was just beside myself. And he um, played for one of his encore pieces, Schubert's Impromptu in A-flat major, which was a piece that I was working on at the time for my jury exams. So what's funny to me when I think back to that first year and to these sort of quirky things that were part of my everyday life, many of those things are still with me today. I still drink coffee, although it seems a little fancier somehow these days. I still listen to the talking heads. I still play Schubert's Impromptu in A-flat major from time to time, although probably not as well as I did back then. 
And while I don't dance to Madonna anymore, I did have the opportunity to edit a four-volume encyclopedia on music in American life. And there's an entry in this particular encyclopedia about Madonna, and I got to write it. So it was pretty fun. And so I want to shift gears a little bit now. And um, what I hope my story will do is to help you just slow down a little bit and think about the many parts of your Penn State experience that are important to you, even the quirky things, and how those things might be with you um, years and years and years from now. I mean, I think as I prepared for this talk, I was surprised at how much happened in my first year as a Penn State student that's still part of my life, and how um, things just kind of, uh, the value that those things have added um, for me. And so what I started to do as I thought about this talk was walk around campus. And I noticed that we have all of these beautiful quotes in different buildings on campus that tell us um, a lot about education and the value of an education and the breadth, the importance of the breadth of the education that you'll have here. So here's a quote by the educator John Dewey. Um, it's on the wall in Dyke Building. If you're students in EMS, you probably pass through this all the time. Um, but here's a quote that says, education is a process of living and not a preparation for the future of living. It's so profound, it's a process of living. Another quote in the same hallway is by the Irish poet, um, Yates, and he says that education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And I think that gets at so many of the passions that you'll have as a student. Um, and as you learn, the more you learn, the more passionate and interested you can become in things. I mean, it's so critical. Here's a quote from our, the library. Um, the love of learning, the sequestered nooks, and all the sweet serenity of books. Boy, Longfellow had quite a way with words, didn't he? I think that's so beautiful. And our libraries are such an important and special part of our, um, of our campus. Um, I could just spend hours in the leisure room or leisure reading room or in the stacks. There's so much to learn. And it's just sort of funny how you think about there are things in your life that if you do too much of it, it becomes a problem. But that's not true with reading. You can never read too much. And so thinking about um, the books that we have and all of the parts of our um, campus that are connected through our libraries is just really, I think, just it's just an amazing part of your Penn State education. Um, here's a quote that is in Sparks Building outside the dean's office. I took these pictures, and I apologize, they're not that great. I'm not a very good photographer. And in this case, I was worried that if I really got the whole quote, um, Dean Welch might wonder if she walked out of her office and saw me on the floor taking a photo up in the ceiling. But this is a quote by Plutarch, and he says, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. The mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. What better place than Penn State than to have that happen to you? Although I am worried, I don't mean to keep bringing up fire quotes. I'm not trying to encourage you to be a pyromaniac, but it's really about passion and, and interest and pursuing things that you love. Um, this is in Sparks. Hundreds of students walk through this, these doors every day. Learn to live, live to learn. Um, in Carnegie Building, a reminder of the role of education in a democracy, and the point being that um, there should be free speech and freedom of the press and the freedom of people to peaceably assemble. How critical is that, and how does your education contribute to those rights and responsibilities that you have as a citizen in a democracy? Here is the uh, mural in Old Main, and, um, Ryan spoke um, very eloquently about the purpose of the land-grant mission, which I also agree is just incredible. And so I won't spend a lot of time on that one. And then I was thinking, well, if I could be the decider, what would I put on the walls? Um, and so I put a couple of um, ideas down. One is a quote from Thomas Jefferson, who said, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. And I think that's so critical as we think about um, our responsibilities to be educated within a democracy. You can't be ignorant and free. You have to be educated in order to be free. And I think um, that's really important to think about. Another quote that is similar in nature is by um, the anarchist Emma Goldman. And so if I was really daring, I would take a red pen and put this one on the wall. Um, the most violent element in society is ignorance. And I think that's what we're working against every day, um, just having an educated population and citizens who are thoughtful and can work through the many problems our society has. 
And so I'll end with a quote um, that's from a Tanzanian saying. Um, it says, I pointed out to you the stars and all you saw was the tip of my finger. And so what I'm hoping is that um, I'm helping you not to see the tip of my finger, but to see the stars and to think broadly um, about your experiences here at Penn State. I hope you will sing, I hope you will dance, I hope you will read a lot, I hope you will engage. There is no other place in the world to have an education um, than there is um, at this institution. I speak from personal experience and I know that from uh, meeting so many um, students and alumni over the years. And so thanks so much for your time and I enjoyed meeting with you. Goodbye.